So the female reproductive system is much more complex than the male's because it serves many more purposes. The male only needs to produce and deliver gametes, but the female has to do that as well as provide nutrition and safe harbor for fetal development, as well as giving birth, then nourishing the infant. And in addition, the female reproductive physiology is much more cyclic and thus the hormones are secreted in more complex sequence compared with that of the relatively steady secretion of regulatory hormones in the male. In this chapter, we'll cover reproductive anatomy, puberty and menopause, oogenesis and the sexual cycle, the female sexual response, then pregnancy, childbirth, and lactation. So, Remember sexual differentiation in the last chapter. Remember the two sexes are indistinguishable for the first eight to ten weeks of development. The female reproductive tract is going to develop from the paramesonephric ducts. You'll remember, you'll recall there were originally two sets of ducts. The mesonephric ducts here, or Wolfarian ducts, and then in purple out here, the paramesonephric or Mullerian ducts. Now the paramesonephric ducts will develop because there is no testosterone present, not because of any positive action of a hormone itself. So in the absence of testosterone and in the absence of Mullerian inhibiting factor, which were both products of the testes, we'll see the female system develop. This is why it's the default system. If something goes wrong anywhere along the line with testosterone production or receptors for testosterone, we'll generally see more female characteristics. Without testosterone to support them, the mesonephric ducts degenerate. The genital tubercle becomes the glens clitoris instead of the glens penis. And the urogenital folds become the labia minora instead of penile tissue. And the labioscrotal folds develop into the labia majora rather than the scrotum. Without Mullerian inhibiting factor or Mullerian inhibiting substance, MIF or MIS, same thing, the paramesonephric ducts are going to develop into the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina, as you see here in the figure to the right. So the female genitalia, again, we have internal and external genitalia. The external genitalia, again, occupy the perineum. They consist of the clitoris, the labia minora, and the labia majora. The internal genitalia, we've got ovaries, uterine tubes, a uterus, and the vagina. Primary sex organs in the female are the ovaries, and the secondary sex organs are all the other internal and external genitalia listed above. So the ovaries produce eggs, or ova, and sex hormones. They're almond-shaped, and they're nestled in the ovarian fossa, a little depression in the posterior pelvic wall that fits the ovary perfectly. Just like in the testes, the tunica albuginea is the capsule that surrounds the ovaries. And the ovary has an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The outer cortex area is here where we see all the various stages of egg development. And then there's an inner medulla which is primarily occupied by the major arteries and veins of the ovaries. Ovaries, unlike testes, they lack their own duct. So in testes, the sperm were developing within the seminiferous tubules. In the egg, each egg develops within its own fluid-filled follicle. You can see the various stages here that we'll discuss later on in this chapter of the egg maturing in this spacious follicle. Ovulation is the event of the egg bursting out of this follicle. So here we have the egg bursting from the follicle. So the ovary is held in place by several connective tissue ligaments. 
It's attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligament right here. And it's attached to the pelvic wall by the suspensory ligament right here. The suspensory ligament is also bundled with the ovarian artery and vein. And the anterior margin of the ovary is anchored by a peritoneal fold called the mesovarium. And it attaches it to the broad ligament here. The ovary receives blood from two arteries very similar to the way the testes are supplied. There's an ovarian branch of the uterine artery and an ovarian artery, which is equivalent to the testicular artery in males. The ovarian and uterine arteries anastomose along the margin of the ovary. That is, they give off a lot of small arteries that enter the ovary. The ovarian veins, lymphatics, and nerves also travel through the suspensory ligament. You can see that here. The uterine tubes, otherwise known as the oviducts or fallopian tubes, are located here. They're about 10 centimeters long and they lead from the ovary to the uterus, but there is no direct contact between the oviduct and the ovary. It's a muscular tube and it's lined with ciliated cells and highly folded longitudinal ridges. Now these ciliated cells act in two ways. First of all, the ciliated cells on the ridges beat towards the uterus, thus pulling the egg down the tube. And interestingly enough, the ciliated cells down in the ditches beat towards the ovary to aid the sperm in its transport up the oviduct as it swims down in the channels between the ridges. So the major portions of the tube are the infundibulum, which is this flared trumpet-like part. And it is covered at its distal end with fimbriae, very feathery projections. And these fimbriae act to sweep the egg that's been ovulated from the ovary into the oviduct. The ampulla is the middle and the longest part. And the isthmus is the narrow end towards the uterus. A piece of the broad ligament enfolds the uterine tube as it does the ovary. This is called the mesosalpinx. Here you can clearly see in the scanning electron micrograph the epithelial lining of the uterine tube with these ciliated cells that either push the egg towards the sperm or the sperm towards the egg depending on their location in the tube. Now the uterus is a thick muscular chamber and it opens here into the roof of the vagina down below. It usually tilts forward over the urinary bladder and its major functions are harboring a fetus and providing a source of nutrition through the placenta and then expelling the fetus at the end of its development. In general, it's a pear-shaped organ, like an upside down pear. The fundus is the broad superior curvature right here. The body is the or the corpus is the middle portion right here. And the cervix is the cylindrical inferior end. The lumen is the space inside the uterus and it's roughly triangular. Its upper two corners are the opening into the uterine tubes and its lower apex ends at the internal os of the cervix. In the non-pregnant uterus, there's not actually a cavity, but it's a potential space. But it can expand when an embryo implants in its wall and develops into a fetus. The cervical canal is a narrow passageway that connects the vagina to the uterus. It has an internal os or opening here and an external os at the distal end. There are glands at the cervix and these glands secrete mucus that prevent the spread of microorganisms from the vagina into the uterus. The uterine wall is composed of the perimetrium, the myometrium, and the endometrium. So the perimetrium is this external serosal layer here. 
The myometrium is the muscular layer. It constitutes most of the uterine wall. It contains mostly smooth muscle. And these muscle fibers sweep down in a spiral fashion around the body from the fundus towards the cervix. Its major function is to produce the contractions during labor that expel the fetus. Now these muscle fibers have varying lengths depending on the time of the reproductive cycle. They're much shorter right around menstruation. And at the time of ovulation, the fibers are much longer. And after implantation, they're even longer. So this is, these are the fibers that allow the uterus to grow in size as a fetus grows inside it. The endometrium is the inner mucosal layer. It's simple columnar epithelium and compound tubular glands. The stroma is populated by leukocytes, macrophages, and other cells to keep it really clean. The stratum functionalis is the superficial half, and that's the part that's shed during a menstrual period. The stratum basalis is the deeper layer, and it is going to regenerate the new stratum functionalis with each menstrual cycle. During pregnancy, the endometrium is the site... The endometrium is the site of attachment of the embryo during pregnancy and becomes the maternal part of the placenta. So the uterus is supported by the muscular floor of the pelvic outlets and folds of the peritoneum that form ligaments around the organ. First of all, there's the broad ligament. This is a very broad ligament composed of two pieces. It's composed of the mesosalpinx as well as the mesometrium on each side of the uterus. There's also cardinal ligaments or lateral cervical ligaments. They support the cervix and the superior part of the vagina extending to the pelvic wall. Here is the cardinal ligament. There are also two round ligaments that arise from the anterior surface of the uterus and pass through the inguinal canals. They terminate at the labia majora, so they're much like the gabernaculum in the male that terminates in the scrotum. And finally, there's uterosacral ligaments here. They're also paired, and they're on the posterior side of the uterus and anchor it to the sacrum. The blood supply to the uterus is very important, as you can understand, both for the menstrual cycle and during pregnancy. So the uterine artery arises here from the common iliac artery, and it gives off several branches as it penetrates the myometrium. First of all, it will lead to the arcuate arteries that traverse the edges of the uterus. They anastomose with the arcuate arteries of the other side of the uterus. There are also many spiral arteries that penetrate through the myometrium into the endometrium. They wind between the endometrial glands towards the surface of the mucosa, and they rhythmically constrict and dilate, making the mucosa alternatively flush with blood. So take a moment here to sketch out a basic uterus involving the ovaries and the oviducts and as many of the anatomical features as you can recall. And this concludes part one of the female reproductive anatomy. I'll see you soon for part two.